straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. The trial of a former Dallas police officer accused of murdering a man in his own apartment. Killing this man was unnecessary and it was unreasonable. Hear from the defendant herself as Amber Geiger says she had to shoot. I ask God for forgiveness and I hate myself. And remembering the life of Botham Jean. Master, the tempest is raging. The billows are That's next on Law & Crime Daily. Welcome everyone, I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. We're giving you an inside look at the murder trial of Amber Geiger, a Dallas police officer who shot and killed Botham Jean, an innocent victim sitting in his apartment when Geiger entered and pulled the trigger. She thought she was returning to her own apartment. She was really entering his, and she was on the wrong floor of the apartment complex where they both lived. The shooting happened as Geiger was returning home from work. Law & Crime Daily's Ann Jeanette Levy has more on how the shooting unfolded. Amber Geiger was not wearing a body camera, but the responding officers were, and their cameras captured the aftermath of the shooting. The video starts in the parking garage at the apartment complex where Amber Geiger and Botham John lived. Officers struggled to enter. Defendant Amber Geiger gave 911 dispatchers the code to enter the gate. Then the frantic officers run up the stairs, trying to reach the fourth floor where the shooting occurred. They arrived, then snake through the labyrinth-like corridors to Botham John's apartment. The defendant's voice attracted their attention. Inside, a shaken defendant said she thought she was in her own apartment when she pulled the trigger. Geiger said she shot Botham John in the top left. She shot twice, but only struck him once. Then the first responders tried in vain to save John's life. John died at the hospital. This is Anjanette Levy for Law & Crime Daily. Thanks, Anjanette. Here to break down the state's version of events is Law & Crime Daily's Terry Austin. Thanks, Brian. Prosecutors say Botham John was simply at home eating a bowl of vanilla ice cream when an intruder burst through his front door as John was trying to get off the couch to figure out who was coming into his home Amber Geiger raised her gun and aimed directly at her target. Geiger shot John twice. No opportunity for de-escalation. No opportunity for him to surrender. Bang, bang, rapid, double tap. While she's on the phone with 911, while she's in the room alone with both of them, she decides to send text messages to her partner. She doesn't one time say, he was coming at me. She doesn't one time say he had a weapon. She doesn't one time say he was scaring me. He made me fear for my life. None of that. And that's when she would have said it. The reason is because it didn't happen. She shot Bo because she thought he was in her apartment. And that's it. That was the prosecutor's version of events. But Geiger's attorneys argue that the state's case was about a rush to judgment. They asked the jury to listen carefully to the facts of the case, and they placed blame on the apartment complex for being confusing. Amber Geiger firmly and reasonably believed that she was in her own apartment. Amber Geiger firmly and reasonably believed that she had confronted an intruder in her apartment. Amber Geiger firmly and reasonably believed that she had no choice, that she had no options but to use her gun to keep from, from dying. That was her firm and reasonable belief. 92 people reported that lived in Southside Flats reported walking, unintentionally walking to the wrong apartment on the wrong floor. 71 of those that lived on the third and fourth floor because the higher you go, the more confusing it is. Additionally, 46 tenants had gone to the wrong apartment just like we learned that Amber Geiger has, and place their key in the door. 
A witness who lived in the apartment complex said he might have heard two people talking just before gunfire rang out. What I would describe as two people meeting each other on a surprise, so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, the doors open and two people meet, and then I hear two gunshots go off. Okay, so let's stop there for a second. You said when you get to the conjunction between the two hallways, you hear what sounds like two people meeting by surprise. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes, ma'am. Was it two separate voices? Yes. Could you tell if one of the voices was giving loud commands like stop police, or anything of that nature. Yeah, but no, nah, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't what they were saying. That's not what you heard? No. Okay. Um, however, you say you didn't hear exactly what you heard. No, I, think I, can't, I can't say I heard any, any, any type of words that I can make out. Once you, in that conjunction between the two hallways, and hear the voices and the pop, how soon after the voices did you hear the sounds of gunshots? Right after. Right after? Right after. It was right. quick. Quick. And the two gunshots you heard, were they quick? They were quick. Joining me now is retired New York police detective turned professor Kirk Burkhalter along with Terry Austin. Kirk, let's start with you. As a former detective, can you tell us what went wrong here? Well, Brian, two concepts I will uh, start with. One is cover and concealment, and the other is trying to obtain a tactical advantage. So first, cover and concealment. This is a concept where put something physical between you and your adversary. It could be something physical or distance. Both work uh, equally as well. And if you have an opportunity, unless the threat is real, and Amber Geiger, Am Amber Geiger never testified that she saw a, a weapon. Two is a uh, tactical advantage. So if you're standing face to face with your adversary, neither party necessarily has tactical advantage. So you certainly, by backing out of the door, putting distance between your adversary and yourself or that wall, and then also gaining a tactical advantage so you can identify your target. And here, she just fired. And it may sound like a Monday morning quarterbacking, but I'm really not, because the purpose of police training, law enforcement training, is so that police officers will act reflexively in a combat situation, which is what she thought she was in. So gotcha. that would be my critique. All right, so let's let's see what else we've got here when you're thinking about the Geiger case, because, of course, that could have been something uh, that Amber Geiger could have done. But still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, defendant Amber Geiger testifies in her own defense, her words under oath, at, right after this break. Former Dallas police officer Amber Geiger took the stand in her own defense. And when asked about the shooting and killing a man in her own apartment, she broke down and forced the proceedings to a halt. Geiger is the Dallas police officer accused of shooting and killing Botham Jean. Geiger was sexting a co-worker when she went inside the wrong apartment, thinking it was her own. She says she approached the apartment door, noticed it was slightly open, and tried to use her electronic key fob to go inside. She describes hearing someone inside and being scared. That's whenever directly in the middle towards the window is when I saw the silhouette figure standing back there. I used my left arm to fully open it. And at that time, that's whenever I'm drawing my service weapon out. And I yelled at him. It's like, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. He started coming towards me. How fast was he coming towards you? A fast paced walk. Wasn't running? Wasn't running. When you saw him coming towards you, what was going through your mind? I thought that he was coming at me. He said he couldn't see his hands. He was going to kill me. Did you hear anything as he was walking towards you? He, there was a loud yell. He was yelling, hey, 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 in an aggressive voice. Yeah. And that's at that point whenever I shot. Somewhere in this area? Yes. When you shot, what happened? He fell down. On cross, the prosecutor demanded to know why Geiger was sexting her partner on the police force instead of helping both him, John. He must have stopped completely giving him CPR when he sent a message to Mark Rivera saying, I need you hurry, right? I did text him that. Okay, and so you must have at that point stopped CPR entirely. Yes, I did. And then not even a minute later, you must have stopped CPR entirely again to send a second message to Mark Rivera. I was already out in the hallway. At... Oh, so you had already left him. 
That's whenever they told me to leave the officers. So that's, no, ma'am, I'm talking about 10.03 p.m. Uh, Mr. Lee, Officer Lee, and Officer Blair didn't arrive until almost 10.05. Yes, I do remember that, like, whenever they showed me, I sent those text messages. You texted Mr. Rivera using your hands. Yes, and, I did. And as you were doing that, you were unable to give Mr. Jean your full attention, the attention that he deserved. Yes, I did. And then you made the choice to do that a second time. Isn't that true? Yes, sir. All right, so at both of those times, you put your needs and your wants over his. I still cared about him. Did you put your needs and your wants over him when you decided to do that? No, sir. Back with me to break down Amber Geiger's testimony is Terry Austin and Kirk Burkhalter. Terry, this sexting argument that came up during cross-examination seemed to be a big point. Do you think it could sway the jury and why? I definitely think it could sway the jury. It was introduced to demonstrate her state of mind. You know, before the event, she was thinking about other things. During the event, she was thinking about other things. She wasn't trying to save him. And I do think they will use it against her. And even more frankly, it's an insinuation, right or wrong, that she's having an affair. So I think the jury's going to think about that. Kirk, I get she's off duty, but she was still trained as an officer. What response do you think she should have given after this accidental shooting, as she describes it? So what's important to keep in mind is that a police officer has a responsibility to render aid to a person that they just shot to, as the same as if they came across that person in the street. So she certainly had a responsibility to, to render the same amount of aid. And I think the jury will certainly take that into account. It could be indicia of uh, some form of her intent to actually kill Botham John. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's a lack of mistake, maybe it's just a bad officer. Depending on how the jury is going to look at this, it's not just the act itself, the shooting and going into the wrong apartment, but the question is going to become, what about after the shooting? What did she do? It would definitely be used against her. But when we return a look at the life of Botham John through videos and music archived by his university. Police shooting victim Botham Jean left quite a legacy, and he was in fact an accomplished singer. Thanks to the archives of his alma mater, we are able to introduce you to him through both pictures and in music. Law and Crime's Aaron Keller has Jean's story. I am Botham Jean, and I am a senior accounting and management information systems major, and I am from the island of St. Lucia. That is the voice, and this is the face of the man whose life ended with the pull of a trigger in Dallas. Chaos surrounded Botham Jean's final moments, but friends and family remember other things a bright smile and uplifting music. At Harding University, a Christian college in Arkansas. Let's praise God this morning. John was an active singer. Bless the Lord of oh my soul. Oh my soul. Follow the law. In the trial of his shooter, Botham John's sister described him from the witness stand as his portrait sat nearby. When he started high school, he started a choir um, at the high school. He also started song leading at our church, Church of Christ, and he fell in love with music. He even wrote songs, church songs. Mourners who attended John's funeral wore red, his favorite color. He was very active in his community, in his hometown in St. Lucia, in terms of serving the youth and in terms of just doing a lot of community service. Attorney yeah. Sue Ann Robinson is of counsel to a law firm which represents John's relatives. The family does definitely want Amber Geiger brought to justice for what she did. I think the outcome is going to be a conviction on murder. That is the outcome that they're looking for. Yes, there is evidence Botham John was not perfect. He used marijuana to treat ADHD. When that became public, critics lashed out at those who thought it disparaged him. And back at Harding, John leaves a legacy. Let the weak say I am strong. The university and his family cherish the music. We found four songs that he wrote. Um, all about um, Christ and wanting to get to heaven. Oh, Santa, oh, Santa. 
it's not just notes and words. A planned $50,000 scholarship in John's honor swelled to more than half a million dollars with support from his employer. The family has chosen to deal with it by celebrating his life as opposed to focusing on his how his life has ended. Botham Jean. A life ended with tragedy, a legacy of hope. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. This is Aaron Keller for the Law and Crime Network. It's all right, it's all right. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Thank you for the update, Aaron. Definitely a light that left us too soon. And when we come back, the verdict for Amber Geiger and the extraordinary reaction from the family of Botham Jean. We, the jury, unanimously find the defendant, Amber Geiger, guilty of murder as charged in the indictment. No outburst. That was the jury's verdict after about five hours of deliberating. The next question, the penalty. Under Texas law, a murder conviction can carry a five to 99 year sentence. Geiger ultimately received a 10 year sentence, but her sentencing hearing was anything but ordinary. Please. During a victim impact statement, the brother of murder victim Botham Jean asked if he could give Amber Geiger a hug. And so, after receiving permission, he did. The image of the man who lost a brother forgiving the woman who pulled the trigger, even telling her that he loved her, led to a massive social media response about the role of forgiveness in the criminal justice system. The judge cried on a bench during the embrace. Afterwards, cameras showed the judge hugging the victim's family, and finally, the judge retrieved her personal copy of the Bible and told Geiger that it was her job to read it, starting with John 3.16. The judge read the passage to the defendant, convicted of murder, and even gave her a hug. Then deputies led Amber Geiger off to prison. Botham Jean's mother spoke after the sentencing hearing, calling for reforms in both state and local police forces. His privacy was violated. Amen. She intruded on him. Yes, she did. And that was not enough. She killed him. Cold blooded. Yes, she did. Cold blooded. Murder. Our life must move on. <laughs> But our life must move on with change. There's got to be a better day. And that better day starts with each and every one of us. The city of Dallas needs to clean up inside. Amen. The Dallas Police Department has a lot of laundry. Amen. The Texas Rangers need to know who's on board. Yes. And every single one of you, citizens of Dallas and residents of Dallas, need to know what to do to get your city right. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. After the conclusion of the jury trial, one of the key witnesses was himself shot and killed in what authorities say was a crime completely unrelated to his testimony. Joshua Brown, who lived across the hall from Botham Jean, was gunned down in what authorities describe as a robbery gone bad. Three people are facing trial in that shooting. Amber Geiger remains in prison, but has appealed her conviction. Her attorneys say that because she was mistaken about where she was, she cannot be convicted of murder. They're asking an appeals court to throw out Geiger's conviction or convict her of a lesser charge, criminally negligent homicide, and to hold a new sentencing hearing. Botham John's family has filed civil lawsuits against the apartment complex where the shooting happened and against the maker of the locks on the doors which were allegedly defective. The family also sued the city of Dallas and Amber Geiger personally. 
A federal judge dropped the city as a defendant, saying there were no grounds for municipal liability. Terry, let's bring you back in along with Kirk. Terry, there have been a number of unarmed black men killed throughout the years, some of which have forever changed, changed sorry, the criminal justice system. Do you see the arrest, trial, and conviction of Amber Geiger as one of those cases that changed the system? Here's what I think, Brian. I think there are many people who are unhappy with the fact that she only got 10 years. Yes, she was convicted of murder, but she only got 10 years. And then there are others who think that this was just a tragic accident. What I will say that impressed me overall with this particular conviction was the fact that the family, the brother in particular, embraced Amber Geiger and even the judge. So I think that left a huge impression upon people who watched this trial. Kirk, same question. Does this conviction change the system? Um, I, I'm not sure about that, because when we think a lot about the, the violence against black men and women, uh, we think about it at the hands of law enforcement. And while Amber Geiger is employed as a police officer, she was off duty at the time this occurred. So she was not in the, the performance of her official duties. Um, so it's very different than what we've seen permeating uh, the, this country in the form of videos and stories and so forth. And certainly we have other folks that have committed these heinous acts, but the focus is really on law enforcement. So I'm not sure how much this has moved the needle forward, uh, given that this is such an extreme case. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you, Terry. And thank you for joining us here at Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.